Welcome back to Living Proof. Are you excited to be here? Yes. There we go. There you are. Let's go ahead and give the Lord uh, some prayer and let's let's pray to the Lord and ask him to, to send his Holy Spirit into this place tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love and faithfulness. Thank you, God, for waking us up this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for orchestrating this this ministry ahead of time, Lord. Lord, you you knew what was going to take place, Lord, ahead of time in this in this ministry tonight, Lord, in this class. So, Lord, we ask that you would touch us today and that you would send your Holy Spirit, that you would orchestrate this tonight, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your precious name. Amen and amen. Would you stand with us if you can? Blessing and honor. This is my 
our story, Lord, and this is our song. Praising you all the day long, Lord Jesus. Yeah. 
knowing that you are bigger than any situation that we bring before you tonight. Lord, we ask that you be with Michelle Hollingsworth. She has an upcoming surgery. Guide the doctors through that. Patricia Jones's cousin Steve has got an issue with his nerves and loneliness. Lord, let him feel your peace. Wrap your arms around him. Let him feel that peace. And Rita Wilcox is asking for an um, issue with finances for her. She's got a friend, Lenny Green. That she's asking for healing and for lungs and an autoimmune disease for her. Her call for continued healing and a recovery on the uh, the things that he had taken off for him. Maria De Jesus, granddaughter Nikki, and her mom Melissa need salvation. We're continuing to claim for Augie Mensa. He's got an upcoming surgery. Lord, what you're going to perform in his life and you're going to do for him. Even as the doctors get ready to do something, you're going to take care of that need for him already, too. For Fran Hilton's daughter, Kathy, has an autoimmune disease. Thomas Brown is asking for uh, a touch for health challenges that doesn't allow him to get out. Manny Gonzalez has got an upcoming reports tomorrow of what you're already taking care of in his heart. Lord, a good good report with that because you've already you've already healed him for it. He knows that. Sally Vibros' son-in-law Frank praying for kidney failure and a cancerous growth on his liver. Gary Vaught, his brother Mark, for salvation for him. And continued prayer for Carl and Ruby West for healing and strength for them. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do for all of these. Lord, anyone else here tonight that has a need that we haven't mentioned, Lord, we give that to you too. You can take care of all these situations, Lord, and we're going to praise you for it when we get the answers. We're going to claim all this tonight with your promises in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, we are looking forward tonight to the conclusion of our series on the church. Next Wednesday night, April 24th, is prayer and praise night. So we will not be meeting in this room. We'll all be over in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock for a time of prayer and worship together with the other adult ministries and with our youth. So don't miss that. Then Wednesday, May 1st, at 2.30 and 7, we will have our birthday celebration for the month of May. Does anybody in here have a May birthday? Me and Peggy. Anybody else? <laughs> well, we'll have a time of fellowship with some special treats and um, our regular service that evening, so you don't want to miss that. Let's go ahead and prepare to receive this evening's offering. If you are giving of your regular tithes and offerings, please make sure to mark that clearly on an offering envelope so you can get proper credit. Otherwise, the offering in its entirety will go to the Living Proof Ministry. Let's pray. Lord, you are so good to us and so faithful. Lord, it is our joy now to give back to you that which you have already bestowed upon us. Lord, we give of our offerings and your tithe, Lord. We pray that you would bless each gift, bless the giver, and Lord, may each gift go to the furthering of your kingdom tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. tonight. Amen. I, uh, I've been on a, a little bit of a, I guess a trip, I guess you'd call it, 
um, I've been listening to my uh, college days music and uh, stuff that came out in the mid to late 90s. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's not college age for you guys, but it was for me. <laughs> It was my coming of age time, you know, that, that, that area of, of anybody's life um, from 18 to about 23, 24, there is so much that changes in a person's life. Um, I've, I've told my boys so many times, I'm like, these years that you are experiencing right now, my older boys, because our oldest is 21 and our middle son is 18, um, told him, I says, these years are formative in your life. What happens in the next few years is going to affect the rest of your life. And when I was 22, I started with the county of San Bernardino, and here I still am there today. You know, I'm 26 almost years later. So it, it, it has shaped my own life, you know, and there were times when uh, I... Uh, I, I Back when I was in high school, I wanted to move to Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'd never been to Colorado Springs. I still have never been to Colorado Springs. Um, but that's where I wanted to go for some weird reason, and it didn't happen. God had other plans. Um, I, God brought somebody into my life. I was wanting to go to Colorado Springs before I met her, and then I met her, and there I am. So, you know... <laughs> You see a pretty face. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I was I was listening to uh, one of my uh, favorite groups I, I, I used to listen to, and um, it was a song called Jury Duty, and it talks about how the person was having a bad day. He says, 5 a.m. on Tuesday, why am I up so early? I drive, they're from Orange County, so I drive out to Santa Ana because I've got jury duty. No breakfast, short-tempered, and I cut my hair, my shape, I cut my face shaving. Ten miles out, I hit traffic. Some days just aren't worth saving. You know, I haven't had the best of days, but I want to stop and thank you anyway. It, they were, it was, it was a Christian band that I listened to at the time. I always, I grew up in the church. I was dedicated as a baby in the church, so, you know, but anyways. At the courtroom, or the courthouse, I waited, and waited, and then I waited. How many people have experienced that before, waiting for jury duty? <laughs> I have two. At lunchtime, my car stalled out. I couldn't get it started. I had a book by C.S. Lewis. I finished the last page and slept on my desk for three hours, just like my high school days. Got home and decided I'd be in a bad mood. My shy and quiet wife said she didn't like my attitude. Got a call from my mother, forgot my sister's birthday. I'm a lousy older brother. Safe to say I've had a bad day. Because every single moment, whether sleeping or awake, is your creation. And what you've made is good. I don't always thank you for the rough days and the hard times in my life, even though I should. When you had a rough day, I haven't had a rough day today. I was just listening to the song. But when you've had a rough day, you give him praise anyway. When you've had a good day, you give him praise anyway. No matter the times you're going through, whether they be down, whether they be up, you give the Lord praise anyway. Which moves right into our lesson, working through church problems. Lesson 13, the central truth for tonight Church problems can be solved by listening to the Holy Spirit and applying biblical principles. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord honor. Follow the Spirit's leading. The, the, the scripture, the key verse for tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. In the King James Version, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. We all have been, we've been all made to drink into one spirit. The New Living Translation says it another way. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body, 
by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to know that we can come in unity to you, Lord, that we can come through your spirit as one body, as one church, giving you praise and being your hand extended to a lost generation. Lord, help us to be that hand extended that lifts up, not tears down. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The global church's health, or lack of it, is most visible in the health of local churches. So the global church is visible, the health is visible in the local churches. A major factor in church health is the ability to overcome challenges that naturally arise as God's people represent Christ in their communities. I'm going to take from an example of what our church has been through in the past. When my family first arrived here in 1990, I was 15, and a couple of years later, um, Tommy Anderson was, uh, there was a fellow from the church that came to, Tommy Anderson was our pastor, he was the Josh Gerbrandt, he was our pastor, and a fellow came to him and said, you're just a showman, there is no authenticity within you whatsoever, and you, everything you do is for show, and brought about, not necessarily charges, but charges to the pastor and said, you're a fraud, and got people in the church to side with him. And we had a vote. Pastor Tim Schock was here during that time, and we had a church vote, and the church vote was to keep Pastor Tommy Anderson as our pastor. And there were people that left because of that. Church problems. But our church persevered. This was in the early 90s. Our church continued to stay strong. The vision that God gave Pastor Tommy of having a sanctuary built on this corner of Nisqually and Balsam came to fruition, came to life. This vision that that God gave my mom, I've told you guys before, um, I'll tell you again, my mom had a vision of this church back when I was a kid, before we moved up here to Victorville. We were down in, uh, in Ontario at Central Assembly of God, and, and, and it, she, re, she came to this church as they were constructing the sanctuary, because we were here during the, during the time, and I've told you guys before, we all wrote scriptures and wrote our names on the concrete that's underneath the carpet, and we wrote it on the on the um, the the platform where all the wood is at, built up. We wrote scriptures, we wrote prayers, we wrote all these names of people that we were praying for. And she stood there and looked in the sanctuary and grabbed a hold of my dad and said, "This is the church. This is the church where where I had that that dream many many years ago." And my dad's like, "What?" Because he, he, she had told him about it, and so it came to pass. This sanctuary. So there was, the devil knew. The devil knew that there was a dream, that there was a vision for the sanctuary on this corner, and he wanted to disrupt it. And so he came in to try and get Tommy out of the church. That's what the devil was trying to do. And then because we voted to keep him in, God's vision stayed. It's because we prayed, God, what is your will for this church? And we voted according to his will, what we felt that God's will was. And so we kept him. We kept Tommy Anderson. And the vision continued. And then we had another pastor. And for circumstances, he left the church. And we had another church split. This church has been through problems. When Pastor John C. Martin came, just before Pastor Josh, this church was, um, lack of better terms, it was on oxygen. It was barely staying alive. It was on a respirator, like you see people who are unconscious in the hospital. That's what this church was. We had, I pretty much 
remember, I, th I think we had less than 100 people on the membership list. I can't remember exactly. But because of the split, because of problems. But now, look at what God has done. Look at where he has brought this church. It is a lighthouse to the lost. It is a hospital for the broken. We have made God the central focus, as it should be. Okay, all that is an introduction. I apologize. <laughs> I didn't mean to skew off on the tangent. Opening activity. What would we say? What would you say is the biggest challenge facing local churches today? This lesson focuses on present day issues that also confronted the early church. You've probably heard the saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. That is often true, even in the church. This lesson deals with six problems that seemed to plague the early church throughout the first century. Legalism, prejudice, worldliness, pride, carnality, and spiritual immaturity. I ran out of fingers. <laughs> These problems have shown themselves to be timeless. But with the Holy Spirit's guidance and empowerment, we can identify ways to overcome them. Part one, legalism and prejudice. We are all saved the same way. Acts chapter 15, here we go, let's get out our Bibles. Acts chapter 15, here's my Bible comes up here. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Let's see. I'm reading in the New Living. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, as do I arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way to Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them much to everyone's joy that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted that Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? Through verse 11, we believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of our Lord Jesus. We do not deserve it. We are all saved the same way, through faith in Christ. History is filled with pivotal moments, events that are still being studied and celebrated centuries later. The Jerusalem Council and Acts 15 is a great example of this. In many ways, it set the church's course for the next 2,000 years and beyond, just like I was talking about earlier when I was telling my boys, these few years are going to change the course of your life or your your life are going to determine the course of your life these few pivotal moments in the early church 
directed which way the church would go. People would no longer ask, can Gentiles be saved? But rather, how can Gentiles be saved? This question prompted many more questions about the law and the legalism that believers are still asking today. In many ways, the central issue facing the Jerusalem Council was the larger question of what role the law should have in a Christian's life. In Acts 15, the specific matter under discussion was circumcision. Paul and Barnabas led a delegation to Jerusalem to discuss the issue with the church leaders and apostles there. In verse 5, it indicates that the church in Jerusalem included a group of Pharisees who had become Christians. They were greatly admired and revered in the first century for their expertise in Scripture, the Pharisees. This posed a problem, though, when it came to the law, and especially as it related to Gentiles. The Pharisees argued that Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. As one of the apostles in Jerusalem, Peter, addressed the Jerusalem church and visiting delegates. He began by reminding them that God intended for the gospel to be preached to the Gentiles so that they could believe. Peter explained that God himself did not distinguish between Jewish and Gentile believers and that those demanding circumcision were, were tempting our, or challenging God with their demand. The mention of a yoke is key. This term was commonly used in Judaism to refer to the law or more specifically the acceptance of the entire law. Peter pointed out that even their ancestors could not bear such a burden. Salvation only came through Christ. The one who said, my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. As Paul stated later, the problem was not with the law. Rather, the problem was that humans cannot keep the law which makes the law insufficient. There is nothing you can do to gain salvation. It is only through faith in Christ. It is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we gain salvation. There's nothing more you can add on. Well, if I keep these holidays, no. Well, if I, if I dress this certain way, no. Well, if I cut my hair shorter, no. If I let it grow, no. The only way you have salvation is through faith in Christ. That's it. Now, because you love Christ, because he has first loved us, because he has forgiven us, we want to do things to please our Lord, our best friend. That's him. That's the Lord. We want to do things that honor him. We want to give to his ministry. We want to be with him, to be with like believers who believe in the Lord and experiences that they have that they want to share and encourage each other in the Lord. There's nothing you can do to gain more salvation. I remember when I was in college, there was one kid that every week he'd raise his hand, I just need more salvation. You don't have more salvation. You get saved. There's a moment in time when you bow a knee, you ask for forgiveness, you turn from your sin, you turn towards him, you are saved. You confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart that he is the Lord. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is your Lord. Amen. He is your God. You confess. There's nothing more you have to do. All of those things that we do, there's because we love him. It's not because you have to, oh, you must act this certain way. No, I act that way because I love the Lord. Because I don't want to offend him. The burden has been made light. We'll move on. Acts chapter 15, verse 22. 
Then the apostles and elders together with the whole church in Jerusalem chose delegates, and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men chose, excuse me, the men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also called Barsabas, and Silas. Verse 23. It says, this is the letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Excuse me. Greetings. You ever talk to anybody? Greetings and salutations. Yeah. Okay. No problem. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching. But we did not send them. So we decided having come to complete agreement to send you official representatives along with our beloved Barnabas and Saul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. Verse 28. Excuse me. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols. You must abstain from consuming blood of the meat of strain or the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. That's it. Farewell. Goodbye. End of story. All the laws of Moses. Oh, you've got to do this. You can't eat lobster. <laughs> you can't have shrimp. No. What do you mean I can't have? I can't have bacon. Oh, no, not bacon. We we had uh, we had a uh, 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 we had a potluck at work today for birthdays for April, and my boss, my uh, my big boss, he um, brought he, he cooked a ham, and he it big, um, literally it was like this this one, it was like this big, and. The girl who was in charge of doing the, um, girl, she's a lady, I'm sorry. She's over 30, she's a lady, I'm sorry. Uh, the lady who was in charge of the event, she said, can, can you come and slice the ham? And I was like, uh, yeah, I guess so. She said, you ever done that before? I was like, yeah. She's um, from Philippines, and she says, I'm not Americanized yet. I don't know how to slice a ham. And I was like, oh, it's not a big deal. Okay, uh, no problem. So I was slicing up the ham, and you know, not as thin as I'd like it to be, but you know, we had a plastic fork and a big, huge knife about this long that was as dull as paper. I mean, it was horrible. <laughs> but I mean, it was strong, so I <laughs> on that thing. All that to say, we had ham. Blah, Moses says, you can't have pig. You can't do, I can't have pulled pork sandwiches. Sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent here. I love food. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols. No problem. I don't have a problem with that. You can't, you can't eat meat or consume blood of a strangled, strangled animal. And, from sec and you must abstain from sexual immorality. Okay, no problem. Those three things. And you will live well. Again, that's not salvation. Salvation comes through faith, through grace of Jesus Christ, through faith in Christ. That's it. The burden has been made light. People have countless perspectives and personal prejudices that affect the way they view others. Prejudice was part of, the, of what the Jerusalem Council was dealing with as Jewish Christians gradually came to accept Gentile Christians as spiritual equals. Whoa, you mean this person who's never set foot in the synagogue and learned from the Old Testament is equal with me? Who, I, I, I'm learned. I am educated. <laughs> I, I've, got a, I've got a PhD in the Old Testament. No, I don't, but you know, yeah, equal. Peter's strong words to the Jerusalem council were immediately reinforced by James and received by the delegates. Two leaders 
from the Jerusalem church, Judas and Silas, were appointed to join Paul and Barnabas in journeying back to Antioch. They would carry a letter that explained the situation and provided the remedy. The letter first explained that the Judaizers, or Ju is that right? Is that how you say that? Judaizers? Judaizers? Whatever. Jews who insisted Gentiles keep the law were neither sent nor approved by the leaders in Jerusalem. So these guys who were making a fuss, they weren't sent by the people in charge. You don't have to listen to them. This is important because the church at Jerusalem held great influence and respect in the early church. The solution the Jerusalem council had reached, not only on their own, but through the leading of the Holy Spirit, was to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. Do not eat food offered to idols. Do not consume blood or meat from a strangled animal. Abstain from sexual immorality. These instructions are among what Jews call the seven laws of Noah, who was the father of both Jews and Gentiles. The Jews considered these commands the, to predate the law and believed they applied to everyone. The first six laws were do not worship idols, do not blaspheme God's name, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not rob, do not consume lifeblood, and establish courts of justice. They countered prejudice without adding any requirements to salvation. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ, in Him alone, that He is the Son of God, that He is the King. He is the King. He is the Lord. Part two, worldliness and pride. Don't be lukewarm. Ooh. Don't be lukewarm. Revelation chapter three, go to the end of the book. Sorry, go to the last book. Revelation chapter three, verse 14 through 22. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. Verse 15, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also, buy white garments from me so you will not be ashamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Verse 20, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Verse 22, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. You notice in verse 20, he's talking to the church of Laodicea. He is not talking to unsaved people. He's talking to the church. Look, I stand at the door and knock. The church of Laodicea has pushed God out of the church. They took Jesus and put him aside. Put him outside the church. He's outside trying to get in. The last church talked to is this one. And I've 
seen studies where professors and those who study prophecy see a timeline from when Jesus walked the earth, when the church was born, and if you go through each one of the churches that are outlined in the book of Revelation, it is a church age. And the last one is Laodicea. That's the church age we live in now. There are so many churches who have pushed God aside. They pushed his works aside. Oh, you want to do, do miracles here? No, we don't have time for that. You want us to witness to unbelievers? We don't have time for that. I am rich. I have everything I need. I don't need I don't need anything from you, Lord. Those are the worst words you could ever say. I don't need anything from you. Oh, if you ever say those words, watch out. Health. Your health, your wealth are fleeting. You need someone to save your soul. Your soul is eternal. This body is a tent. This is just where I happen to reside. C.S. Lewis put it, I don't have a soul. I have a body. I am a soul. This thinking up here, this consciousness that I have, this is my soul. That, that, that's who I am. My, that's what makes me who I am. My attitude when it's wrong when it's grumpy, when I come home and I throw attitude. <laughs> there are times when I've thrown a little bit of attitude. Nah. She's been a widow. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. That's, you know, there's times when I'm happy. <laughs> like, hey, this great thing happened today. Oh, I'll share something that happened today. Okay. That, that, was, that was really cool. Okay, it wasn't necessarily for me, but you know, it was. It, I thought it was neat. And it, it made me happy. My son, my oldest son, uh, Zach. He's 21. He's attending Redlands. And he's finishing up his third year. His uh, major is music composition. His minor is business administration. So business. That he's taking business courses, and he applied for an internship job at my office, and um, put in the application in HR, and it sat there. And I was like, nobody's saying anything. So I emailed one of the bosses, not my boss, I emailed one of the bosses. And I was like, hey, do you guys have any interns? Uh, we call them PSE, it's a public service employee. That's what we call them. It's an intern job. It's part time. I'm going to get through this real quick. Um, but anyways, he said no. I, then I emailed my boss. And he said, yeah, we have one. I said, oh, my son Zach, blah, 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 finishing his third year, minor in business. And just wanted to put that out there for you in case you're interested. He says, okay, thank you. And uh, today, my, uh, my son calls me. Hey, um, my, my boss's name is Ibram. He says, Ibram called me today. He wants to interview me on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. I'm like, praise the Lord. Hot dog. That's great. It made me happy. Yeah, I, when I get happy, I say hot dog. And, and, <laughs> sorry, it reminds me of uh, you know, Jimmy Stewart in, in uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Hot dog. You know, <laughs> but you know, anyways, the, the, the point is, you know, that's the soul. Uh, your, your, your happiness, your joy, your, your, your sorrow, your bad attitude. Or, you know, that your body is, is tangible. Your body is breaking apart. Comparisons often made between the present day church and the church of Laodicea, which had become self-reliant and saw little need for God. I need God. I don't need this body. I don't need my riches or wealth. I, I'm not rich. My, my house, uh, my, my car. <laughs> That's another song that I listened to. The, the, the group that I was telling you about earlier. He talks about my car, my, my Lexus, my yacht, my gold chains and rings. These are a few of my favorite things. And I was like, ah. But, you know, that, that's, that's at the time, somebody who, Laodicea, I don't need God. I've got my riches. You look around. 
And all these people, I was reading an article today. There's like a, over 100 cities in the state of California where the housing median is over $1 million. The housing median, that's the average house. Over 100 cities in our state. Oh, how, many, how do people live? They, and, and people buy it. They buy these houses. They have stuff. I don't need the Lord. You need the Lord. Oh, sorry. I got sidetracked again. The letter to the church of Laodicea opens with a vivid description of Jesus as the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. The Hebrew word amen means faithfulness or truth and is sometimes used in scripture to signify God's steadfast nature. This description of Jesus in Revelation drew a sharp contrast to the unfaithfulness of the Laodicean church. And verses 15 through 18 are a harsh and elaborate rebuke against them. Positioned at a crossroads in the ancient Roman world, Laodicea was a wealthy city. This abundance had corrupted the faith of the believers there. Material wealth had blinded them to their spiritual poverty. I fear for our society, our community. I fear for the people who have much because they don't need. I am thankful for the people who do have much, like Lindsay Snyder, the owner of In-N-Out Burger, the owner who is a believer, who is faithful to the Lord, and who gives to the poor. I am so thankful for those who are in positions of authority, who are humble, who are gracious with what God has blessed them with, and they bless others. I'm so thankful for people who keep their head on straight. Now, it took her a little while. If you ever want to, um, I would encourage you to read her story. <clears throat> it is a very interesting story. She went through pain first, and now she's back with the Lord. In short, the Laodiceans had become worldly to the point of being spiritually repulsive. Repulsive. God, another translation didn't say, I'll spit you out of my mouth. It says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Repulsive. Thankfully, God graciously corrects those who he loves. Verse 20 is often used as an invitation from Christ of those outside the faith, but we cannot lose sight of its original text, original context, excuse me. Jesus was inviting the Laodicean Christians to return to fellowship with him. Although they had wandered away, he had not forgotten them. <clears throat> I was texting my son, Zach, earlier today, and I was going over our, the names of our kids, Zachary, Gabriel, Joey, the meaning of their names. Zachary, it means God remembers. I'm going to emphasize on that. God remembers. I texted him. I said, if you ever get into a place where you feel forgotten, you feel left out, you feel like... God's nowhere around. Just remember your name. Say your name. Speak your name. Zachary. Zachariah. God remembers. That's what it means. God remembers. Speak that when you're in a time of trial, when you feel like hopeless. God remembers. God knows where you are. He knows your name. He knows your every thought. God opposes the proud. First Peter. Okay, I got it right tonight. First Peter, chapter five. For those of you who were last week, 
I'm sure you're giggling. First Peter chapter five, verse five through seven. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. Am I, am I in the right place? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of you, <laughs> sorry, and all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and, the right, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Verse 7, give all your worries and cares to God. For he cares about you. Remember that old song? Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And then the ladies repeated it. And for he uh, will lift you up. And it's in minor. It's in a minor key. I, I did it in major. Sorry. Higher and higher and he will lift you up. Yeah. Remember that old song? Yeah, I do too. Pride is a complicated word. Even when we set it aside, it's set aside its cultural meaning related to him or homosexuality and gender issues, it's a well-known vice. But at times we use the word in a positive manner. Take pride in your work. Or you make my heart swell with pride. So it is important for us to clarify what Peter meant by his statement that God opposes the proud. This passage opens with an interesting word picture. Dress yourself in humility as you relate to one another. It was Lucifer's fall. It was pride found in his heart. Then he fell, became Satan. Peter put humility in the most basic spiritual terms by quoting Proverbs 3.34, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The ego is naturally at odds with the kingdom of God. The one who humbled himself to, to the point of becoming human for our sake. In the Old Testament, God's hand represented discipline and deliverance. Both meanings apply in Peter's epistle, and they apply to us as well. As we submit to God in every aspect of life, we are shaped into the image of Christ and imitate his character by showing love and humility toward others. The familiar exhortation in 1 Peter 5.7 to cast all your care upon him refers to the many difficulties believers face while trying to lead godly lives in an ungodly world. Jesus will carry these burdens for us because he cares for us. Pride. Pride cometh before the fall. Heard that. It's different than having pride in your work. It's, it's, a, different, if it, it's a different type of context. It's not the same thing. Being prideful also mean cocky. Like, I am somebody. I got the attitude and I got enough toot to go around for everybody else. So you just, I, I got the toot going. Come on. Uh, I, I don't do that well. Uh, I, I had to take lessons in school marketing, how to market yourself. Because, you know, I was the youngest grandchild. I was the youngest kid and the youngest grandchild. So I wasn't babied. I wasn't special. I wasn't, you know, spoiled rotten like some babies of the house are. No, uh, if I would, I was lucky if I got whatever I got because there were 14 grandkids and there were seven of my mom's siblings. And so when I went to grandma's house at mom, mom's mom, when I went to their house for her house for Christmas, you're lucky if you get a little, oh, here for everything. Oh, thank you, thank you for this little tiny toy. You know, that's that, That's it. That's all you're getting. Because everybody else has got stuff. And, uh, something that my dad uh, always talks about when he first dated my mom is that if there's one piece of fried chicken left on the platter in the middle of the table, don't reach out with your hand. Because if you reach out with your hand, you're going to get about four or five forks in the back of your hand. <laughs> 
because there's so many other people that are grabbing for it. So that's the, uh, that's the idea that I'm trying to drive a point here. Pride, don't be prideful. Some people, you just, you're, you learn humility because you're the smallest and everybody else is bigger than you and, okay, I'm trying to get to the point. Moving on, um, be humble. Be humble in everything that you do. He will lift you up. Be humble in your work. Be humble at your house. What Pastor Josh was talking about on Sunday, when Pastor Gwen and Pastor Arnold were up on the platform and he was questioning them, humility. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Wives, respect your husband. It all starts with a humble spirit. Always starts with a humble spirit. Part three, carnality and immaturity. Immaturity. Still controlled by your sinful nature. First Corinthians, I gotta hurry up. I apologize. First Corinthians chapter three, verses one through four. Dear brothers and sisters, I was with you. When I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. Verse 2. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger, and you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? Verse 4. When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of the world? You should be following Christ. Have you ever been so exasperated with someone that you told them to grow up? <laughs> one of your kids? Watch you grow up? <laughs> yeah, I did that. <laughs> The challenges of maturity are not limited to growing physically or emotionally. We, we also need to mature spiritually. That kind of maturity is on display in the way we conduct our lives, the way we treat each other. When our, young, our oldest was just a little boy, I used to say, oh, I can't wait till he's 12 so I can play baseball with him. I can ride bikes with him and I can do this with him. And then 12 came and went. No, no, I'm wishing for those days back. <laughs> grow up. Oh, I don't, don't grow up so fast, kids. <laughs> Paul continued to his exhortation to the Corinthians by giving an exceptional harsh evaluation of their spiritual state. This is different than what I explained. This is their spiritual state. These are people that aren't ready for the meat of God's word yet. They're still sucking on milk. And, and they, they don't have any teeth grown in. The infant has no teeth. And then they grow and they get teeth. And it's a horrible process because they get fevered and they scream and they yell and you have to pace in the hallway and you hold them. Oh, I know, I know. And you're up all hours and then they grow more and then they become a five-year-old and they can have cheeseburgers and pizza and then they grow up even more and they have they're 10 years old and they can kind of chew some chicken off the bone and they can have small bits of steak or whatever you know steak and, and then they're 15 to 20 and then they go buy their own steak because they have a job because you're paying for it uh, anyways the point is where there's states of growth that's what he's talking about. He was telling them they weren't ready for the meat. They weren't ready for the steak and potatoes of God's word, essentially, with a side of broccoli that just stays on the plate. You know, the, the, the steak and the potatoes, that's what they weren't ready for. At the root of the problem was a sad reality. You are controlled by your sinful nature. For this reason, Paul had to treat them as spiritual infants, focusing on basic virtues rather than deeper doctrines. 
The signs were evident in their relationships with one another, which were filled with jealousy and quarreling. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? In their mature, immature behavior, the Corinthian Christians were acting like people who had not been transformed by Jesus. Allow God to do a work in your life so that you can become mature in Christ. So you can learn the deep truths of Christianity, of who Jesus is, what he has done. Paul presented an example of their, diver the, their divisive quarreling. He and a charismatic teacher named Apollos served in Corinth, which was a major city in the province of Achaia, Achaia, whatever, as mentioned in Acts chapter 18. Both were doing a good work for the Lord, but the Corinthians had a distorted worldly view of ministry, which led them to take sides based on whether they preferred Paul or Apollos. It's not who take who. It's not a person and a person. That's a person. That's a human. That's a man. He's going to fall. He's going to have problems. You follow Christ. Moving on. God does the work. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Verse 5. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. See, that's what he's talking about. I'm just a man. Who am I? I'm just a man. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your heart. Apollos watered it, but it was the Lord who made it grow. Verse 7, it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. It doesn't matter who plants the seed? It doesn't matter who waters the seed. It matters that the seed grows. That God's word that is planted in the heart of your loved one, that it grows. That's why when you have a loved one, and they don't necessarily attend your church. Ask them, do you go to church? Do you read your word? Well, yeah, I do. I go to this other church over here. Oh, great. More power to you. I pray that God ministers through that church to you. Because it's God's work in the person's life. It's not who's talking to them. It's as long as they're teaching scripture, as they're teaching the Bible truth, as long as they're getting the Bible into their church and into the people's lives, that's what matters. Bible truth. God does the work. People have always been drawn to celebrities, even in Paul's day. His response to the division over his and Apollos' ministries was to remind people that only God can bring forth fruit in any kingdom endeavor. Paul refuted the Corinthians' immaturity by confronting their wrong ideas and values. Paul and Apollos both preached the gospel faithfully. Each did their part to humbly serve God. But the Corinthians were divided over wh whose role was more important. They were drawn to personality and function, losing sight of kingdom principles. Such carnal battles continue today. May, maybe we divide over the kind of ministry or sermon or music we prefer. But Paul reminds us the answer to such disunity is to grow in the Lord together. The, the, the music that I was listening to. It's probably something that none of you guys would ever hear or want to hear. The, the, the stuff I was listening to that I was quoting earlier. It's, it, it's a band called the Orange County Supertones. They were a ska band back in the 90s. And ska lasted for about mm, a minute. <laughs> and then it went away. 
it was it was probably popular for about two or three years and then it was gone. But I still listen to that stuff because you know that's what I grew up with. Yeah, that's my yeah. You know, driving down the road and listening to believers minister to me. You know, it, there are times when I listen to I listen to instrumental music on my on my phone at work when I and it's it's all hymns. That's it's my hymn station. It's what it is. You know, it, it's it's peaceful. It's relaxing. People around me don't complain. They sit on the other side of the partition. I turn it up a little bit, and they're, hey, turn it up some more, because I'd like to hear. So it kind of helps the day go by faster. You know, it, it just all depends on the mood that a person is in. Paul reminds us that such disunity, to, the answer to disunity is to grow in the Lord together. Grow together. Get into the word. Get into the scripture. Get into the teaching of God's word. Grow together. What is God saying to us? Many problems in the local church result from human conflict. So the solution often results from building relationships through fellowship, prayer, love, and the kind of mutual respect that comes from seeing one another as bearers of the image of God. Respect your brother or your sister in Christ. They are the image of God too, not just you. They are too. Introduce yourself to someone in your church that you don't know. What? You mean I gotta reach out? <laughs> I'm very introverted. I'm not an extrovert. To uh, try to make this a practice when new people visit, go out. And if you need to work on it, work on it. Go out and introduce yourself. Hey, how you doing? It's good to see you today. I, I, I greet at the front door. But I'm not an extrovert. I just have a loud voice. <laughs> okay, God bless me with that. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you today. God bless you. Every... Two seconds, I'm saying it. You know, because there's a new person coming in. Greet them. See somebody you don't know? Go up and introduce yourself. Hey, how you doing? I've seen you here a few times. I haven't got your name. I'm Jim Bob. <laughs> Pastor Jim Bob. <laughs> Perform an act of humble service for someone this week. Start with your spouse. <laughs> if you need somebody to start with your best friend start with your spouse then start with your best friend then the co-worker you can't stand no I'm just kidding no you, you, you want to get there you want to get there <laughs> look for ways to compliment and encourage fellow Christians in your church as a way to establish relationships that are not so easily strained by differences wow bearing each other's burdens. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord. Thank you for this message. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us the opportunity to give back to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for teaching us tonight to be more like you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would touch us tonight, that we would not be like the church of Laodicea, that we would not push you out, Lord. Lord, you are our first love. You are our God. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are our best friend. You are our King. You are our Prince of Peace. You are everything to us, God. Lord Jesus, how could we ever push you away? Lord, just surround us, for even right now, with your Holy Spirit. Lord, those who are broken, those who are hurting, those who are challenged with situations that are beyond their control, Lord, even now, Lord, move by your Holy Spirit and lift them up and encourage them. Bring your, your Spirit down upon them and saturate them with your love, with your grace, with your mercy, Lord, with your goodness, Lord. Those who need healing, Lord, we ask that you would heal them 
from their toes all the way to their head, Lord. Lord, you know how many hairs we have on our head. You know what we are going through. You know what ails us. You know what the doctors have told us, Lord. But we know that you are faithful. You are true. You are a healer. You are the maker of our bodies. You are the maker of our souls. You are the creator of this whole world. And you hold us in your hands. So, Lord, we ask that you would touch us tonight. That, that you would draw us close to you. Lord, that you would make us whole. And that you would, that you would make us in, as one church, as one body. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for the praises that we've had tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. There are three easy ways to give tonight. The first is through PushPay. Simply text through your smartphone, VF Assembly to 77977. The second is by going to the church website at www.vfassembly.org and click Give at the top right side of your screen. The third way you can give is to mail your giving directly to the church at 15260 Nisqually Road in Victorville, 92395. Thank you and may God bring his richest blessings upon you as you give. God bless.